exciting conference and what a privilege it is to be presenting to so many diverse perspectives here. Uh, I know we have students in the audience, I know we have clinicians, we have designers, we have people starting careers, starting new careers in the midst of their passion right now. Uh, so I, I really invite uh, the conversation afterwards. I know we have some time built in for questions, but I'm going to pepper you with questions throughout because as, as an academic, that's what I get to do, right? Uh, at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy, we like to believe that we're reimagining the future of healthcare with our students. One unique element of education that I think I can say safely, everyone in this room has gone through some level of education. So to kick off your thoughts on what questions you might have for me. I'm going to invite you to answer the question now in your heads. If you think back 10 years ago, maybe 5, maybe 20, however long ago your education was, which class do you remember? Was it your teacher from elementary school? Was it that one class in undergrad? Was it part of your medical training? What do you remember from your education? We have four classes of 110 plus students in our Doctor of Pharmacy program that graduate each year. Healthcare is changing as we all know, but the unique element of our students' education is that at a minimum of six years and ranging from anywhere from eight to ten when you include things like postgraduate residency for our students, the span of training can encompass the entire life cycle of a different idea, a service, a product. So when our students are experiencing multiple changes in healthcare as they're trying to understand what their role is in it, could you imagine what 10 years in the future looks like? If you try to imagine what you're going to be doing, you get a chance to not only be a part of the future, you get to lead it. And that's important for our pharmacy students. Today, 90% of Americans live within five miles of a pharmacy. And that level of access is incredibly important when you look at a number like this, 2.7 billion prescriptions each year. Now, a quote that I love is that there are more pharmacies than any large fast food chain in the US. And you can even combine probably the top two or three and still get more. There are more places to get your simvastatin, your beta blockers, than a place to get a tall coffee from Starbucks. So what does this mean for our students? What does 10 years look like when we know that healthcare is going to be different? We may have more patients. We may have patients who are sick with new classifications that didn't exist before. After graduating from the Doctor of Pharmacy program myself, I've spent years creating the innovation program at the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. And the three components that we have now include our curriculum, our partners, and the projects. This is a very simple but powerful framework. Our students, as they're learning and as they see themselves 10 years into the future, learn how to think, do, and show what can be changed in healthcare. And that's particularly important when we go back to that first picture, a large empty lecture hall, a lecture hall like we're sitting in now. Can you do these things to think, do, and show in the confines of four walls in the classroom? The way we approach our curriculum is a challenge. I think every educator might agree that there's more and more that we have to teach and less and less time that we have to teach it in. So when I try to throw out buzzwords like I say teaching innovation, is a typical response something like this. When I asked you what your favorite class was from 10 years ago, from five years ago, from when you were in school, does this represent your favorite class? Does this represent what you remember learning? Putting some teeth to some fantastic presentations we've already had, elements of design thinking, uh, how to approach patient care by learning directly from the patients. Our approach towards teaching innovation is really any five steps that I could put up here. I like these steps in particular because they represent things like humility and in step one, not knowing is okay. 
the great phrase of your unknown unknowns. You don't know what you don't know. With 5,000 plus medications, even more over the counters and new medications being approved every month, or as we'll hear in our future presentation, the process of new medications being approved changing, there's no way you'll know everything. So being able to know that you don't know everything is a great start. Because you can add to that toolbox, how do you ask the right questions? When you ask the right questions, your knowledge base grows infinitely. In our third step to find the answer, I call that improving students' Google foo. You have the entire world at your fingertips when it comes to knowledge. How do you train students to access what is an ever-changing body of knowledge? So taking those three steps together, getting the thought process down, and learning that when you implement, you're going to fail, and that's OK, because you can learn as long as you do it quickly, and that when you do find that tenth option that is successful, how do you make sure that it's successful for everyone? So to give you an example of how we implement this into a world-class clinical education, concepts like design thinking, like return on investment. One example I'll pull from is our first year. So just about 16 weeks after they start learning patient care anatomy and physiology, our students learn the FDA drug approval process. I could probably cure insomnia if I talk this out and explain it. And when I'm trying to deal with students who are dealing with four other classes, I know that we have to approach this differently. So to teach the drug approval process, we took a 14-week course and we created a semester-long game out of it. We call it our expedition, because the mark of a good academic is a bad pun. Our 114 students had groups of six. There were 20 groups that weren't just groups. They weren't just sitting in a classroom. They were 20 companies that were startups. They had to take a compound from its molecular entity through phase one, two, and three clinical trials, and then become an FDA-approved product. They self-appointed a CEO, a CFO, a chief marketing officer. Somebody had, everybody had an executive position within these student companies. And so a classroom no longer just had lectures. They had executive briefing sessions where they learned, how do I approach what a market is? They created their clinical trials, and they input that into a platform that we co-developed with our university uh, school of information science. And they got information from commercial-based software that represents the current literature and the actual outcomes of the dose, the specific populations they chose, and the uh, rates of side effects. They put that into simu simulated mannequin. And they got real world data. What would it look like if they were doing it in the real world setting? Across these 14 weeks, we had no more than six to seven lectures. We didn't have tests. Instead, we had investor meetings. These 20 companies had to pitch their outcomes to us. They had to ask the educators, the TAs, the faculty for millions of dollars for investment. These students left not necessarily with just a grade. They had a portfolio. They didn't fill in a multiple choice answer on where does money go? How many millions does it take? They showed what they spent it on. They had to present it as if they were asking for another $20 million when their first trial failed and what they learned in order to get their second one. They had not short answer questions about what phase two meant for them. They created their own letterhead, which was my understanding that they were really passionate about it. And they put their outcomes into patient-friendly information and terms so that everyone would know why they're seeking a phase two or phase three, what this means for that particular disease state, and why patients should care, and somehow fit that all into one page. And complete with the septuagenarian doing physical activity and being active, they made FDA-compliant advertisements for their made-up products. Without tests, it's difficult to understand how patients are engaged or what they're doing. But I knew we had something that was successful when we did this the first time this spring, when in the midst of lectures, we had students who tried to buy out other CEOs. They tried to look for information and made their own press releases based on literature they found specific for the disease states they chose, because maybe they had a family member who was interested in 
the care that Alzheimer patient receive, that cancer in oncology receives, and they looked for the answers behind that. And I really knew we were onto something when in the middle of the lecture, a company tried to sue another company while setting precedence over a trademark issue. By learning how to think about these problems and these challenges, our students walk away with a very unique skill set. The partners we have form individuals and experts, academic interests and corporate interests that solve the problem that comprise today's real world issues. Our partners, whether they are our university partners, whether they're a pharmacy chain, whether they're a pharmaceutical company, they have the problems that they need to solve in order to provide care for patients. We have the students who are capable of solving those problems. So by bringing together our spirit of innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, this process of think, do, show to our corporate partners, we have a living laboratory. And just in our own backyard, our campus, unique intellectual capital that we offer, where in 15 minutes, I can take a problem in the world of pharmacy, I can walk to a school of information science and ask a data scientist what they think, I can talk to an engineer, I can talk to a creative writer, how they see different problems. So our partners provide the opportunity for our students to do what they're learning. And our projects are the way that our students demonstrate that not only are they capable of understanding, they're capable of impacting the change that they want to see when they're in practice. They can show by doing. When they're solving problems today, they enter the world thinking, what's next? Our students enter a variety of occupations and positions after they graduate. The skills that come across all of these are what we try to imbibe all of our projects with. Starting by knowing what they don't know. Starting with what our students are experts at. From our students in the clinic, they're experts at having to have patients wait for them. They identify that this was something that they wanted to change in one of our first projects. Underneath our innovation program is our innovation lab. Our students come to us with things that they don't like. They come to us with our how might we questions. And the first ones that they chose, how do we solve the problem of waiting in line at a pharmacy? To pick up those 2.7 billion prescriptions. To teach patients, what does a pharmacist do? It's more than just big bottle to little bottle. Our students are experts in a variety of things. Pizza is one of those things. When they could look at an industry that shows where in the process of ordering a pizza that they'll be able to eat in 15 minutes or less, they ask themselves, why can't our patients who are waiting for possibly life-saving medication understand where their prescription is until it gets to them? They looked at what is currently used in the industry to teach, to improve wait times, to help people understand. They came up with a waiting dashboard. They used these principles of low fidelity prototypes. They made mistakes, they sketched. They came up with an idea that they wanted to see in their future, complete with, of course, things like Steeler scores and updates. We worked with our computer science program to introduce our students to the technical aspect, to introduce the technical experts to the clinical aspects. And over three or four iterations, they were able to create a dashboard that our patients can use on their phone to see where their prescriptions are. They get an update with patient-friendly information to explain what is the role of the pharmacist. If there's an issue, you can demonstrate it on this dashboard in a HIPAA-compliant manner. Our students came from an idea, more so a problem, to asking the questions, to drawing what they thought might be important, to seeing what they want to see in the future. And they've developed a prototype that we're ready to pilot in stores today. So when we look at the life cycle of what changes in healthcare, 
we know that communication is one of the biggest issues across multiple aspects. When we asked them two or three years ago, what do they want to see that's different? The technology that was most interesting that they saw throughout the entire life of its hype curve within just their clinical education was Google Glass. So we bought Google Glass and we told them, here, we gave them the full length of a runway just by saying yes. And they created something from that process of thinking, doing, and now showing what they thought pharmacy would look like 10 years from now. We're in a community pharmacy, the clinician would be wearing a Google Glass, what they might see, and what information would be most relevant to them. They didn't just think about it, they actually showed what this would look like. And they walk away with a fairly strong understanding that there's more to education than just the four walls. This process of thinking in a curriculum, doing in a living laboratory, and showing the projects that come is the foundation of innovation. And we know from the students, the biggest thing is I want to know that it's working. So hearing directly from the students, the concept that inadvertent learning is probably my favorite phrase from any of the feedback I've gotten. What they'll remember, what I asked you 10 years ago, what do you remember? What they'll remember 20 years from now is learning without trying. They went above and beyond what they were required to do in their education because they wanted to. They wanted to represent their profession. And when you can walk away as an educator with somebody saying that you had a pretty dope class, <laughs> hopefully that's something I'll remember 10 years from now that I was able to tell my students. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Great question uh, from the audience. We asked, what was it like to try to get buy-in from our upper administration? Is that correct? We were lucky in that it was both the students who came saying we want to do something when I was in school, and our administration saying most simply, in one word, they empowered us. They said yes. We said, we want to do this. They said yes. We said, what do you think about us trying different technologies in pharmacies? They said yes. And we let our students know that they can ask, and our administration know that they can say yes. Excellent question. Great question. So from one example, uh, Walgreens as a chain, uh, trying to redefine the role of a pharmacist by bringing them behind the counter to talk to patients. And so the way we see that fitting into our lab, right now, uh, we're very product-based. So when we have 2.7 billion prescriptions, we're automatically that patient care provider that's linked to a product. And we think that medications are just one of the many things that we can do. So if we approach this from a design process, the user is a patient, and the task is to either improve or maintain their health. The pharmacist can facilitate those tasks, but medications are just one of those ways. By having our future predicted by our students that maybe the pharmacist isn't billing anymore. Maybe dispensing or the process of getting a product to a patient is completely automated. Then the role becomes apparent of, well, what offer or what value does the pharmacist have to consider? And that's what we teach them. If product wasn't even an option, what would you want to be able to do 10 years from now? Thank you for your question involving partners from those various problems, involving the stakeholders, and having that discussion now led by our students who understand that it comes from the patient. Having Dr. Rowland say, this is the problem with bad medicine, having a patient tell us this is the problem, and having our students say, great, let's work on this together, regardless of setting, is how I think our program would approach that. Great question. We can talk more after it gets more. Thank, Thank you. you so much.